Welcome, friends, to episode 233 of Color of Magic, a magic gaming podcast where we talk about all types of issues that affect gamers at and away from their gaming tables and computers. As always, I am your host, Power Dragon, and for 233 episodes, still got my main man riding shotgun, Brian Allen. Brian Sionic, how's it going, man? Doing great. Uh, by the time y'all see this or see and hear this, got to remember both of those. It'll be uh, baseball will have opened. The Rangers are going to be in defense of their first ever world title, which is wild. I did not think I would possibly ever see that, and it's happening. Man, anything's possible. I think that's why when we watch sports, we like we literally can say anything's possible in sports. Like we've seen some crazy. If you told things. me twenty years ago, I'd live to see both the Rangers and a Cubs title. I'd have told you you were high. It's just well, yeah. <laughs> well, the Cubs were supposedly cursed, so you know they weren't supposed to win one. Right. But yeah, as always, if you are wanting to support the show, we have a few ways. We are talking to some sponsors, but hey, if you got some products you want, supported events coming up, you want to get some extra eyeballs or ears on, let us know. Shoot us a message. You can shoot us, get us over on the Twitter machine or X, if you call it that now, or you can, you know, shoot me a message directly. I'm available everywhere. But you can also go to patreon.com slash color magic and you get a shout out just like Brayden Greenlee's. How's it going, buddy? Thank you so much for being a patron. And, you know, you could support us that way, too. So we really, really appreciate it. Also. Typically, if you're listening to this, remember to leave a review, leave a comment, give it the five stars, share it around. That helps more than anything. Even if you can't support us financially, share it on different websites, different feeds, groups, whatever you're in, where you think somebody might find us interesting. But let's get into our lead story here for a second, which I think is going to get some players upset when I say these words. But I think players really want power creep. And I know that's like a controversial thing, but it's come up multiple times before where when we have cards that aren't as, we'll call them obviously exciting, right? Over the top, you know, better stats than their cost, stuff like that. Those get people all worked up and excited and people are talking about them. And there's all these discussions on Twitter and everybody's making YouTube videos but then we get sets where there's a bunch of good cards, but there's nothing super crazy, nothing that's obviously big that you have to shove into some decks immediately. Those tend to be the ones that don't get as much hype and that people don't talk about as much and they don't sell as well. And even comparing Karlov Manor to Thunder Junction, and both sets have different things people complain about. Like we've mentioned it before about the theme and the location and stuff not necessarily being the right thing for Karlov Manor potentially. But there are a lot of useful cards but nothing that's crazy but even using that set as an example it took a pro tour event to happen to take one of the mythics from being like five dollars to 25 dollars over a weekend right but before everybody's like oh this card's okay but whatever but then as soon as somebody showed them like oh no here's the potential of the card all of a sudden everybody's all into it and the card's nuts and everybody's trying to figure out how to deal with it but in thunder junction we already have a whole pile of cards in just two days of previews that Everybody's excited about it. You're hearing, seeing all this hype and people are concerned that a card's going to be too good or this is going to change this metagame or whatever. But even that creates sales when the reality is if we take 10 cards and say these are all going to be game changers for metagame, well, they can't be true because something's going to be worse than the other card. Now, some number of them probably will be. I say realistically, probably four or five, right? And then there'll be a bunch of others that are just playable that make their way into decks. But a bunch of those aren't going to be that. But just because they're better statted or they fit a certain theme for a commander or they're hype worthy, that gets people talking and that gets people excited about cards. So as much as people want to be mad about it, and I think this applies to several games, not just Magic, I think you need companies to do that so they can keep the hype machine rolling to sell more cards and keep people interested in the game and keep people talking about it. I mean, we've seen it with other games. Hell, even with Raw Deal, we ended up getting a whole different type of backstage cards or whatever, right? Like that that was a whole thing for the pregame. We added a whole separate segment to the game that didn't even exist in the beginning, but it got people excited and talking. Right? Although it did kind of eventually kill the game also. <laughs> well, licensing with WWE officially killed the game. I yeah, think was- but I, I mean, I remember I had a friend, for example, that like, you know, he started playing with me in Shreveport. And then as soon as we moved away from each other, he had stopped playing and then came back to it 
after, let's say, probably six or seven years. And, and just, why does it take 25 or like, you know, 10 minutes before the game even starts? Well, because I got to play my pro oh, yeah. card. They got to play my manager. They can do this. He's like, this, I don't even recognize this game anymore. But, you know, there's people that say the same thing. When they didn't play for a while, they come back and there's planeswalkers. You know, they're like, also what true. even is this card? Right? Like, you have to explain to her how it works. Like, wait, so I can attack it? Like, yeah. So I can end up damage her? Like, yeah. But then, like, it just stays there? So it's like an enchantment? Well, not really, because it has other abilities. You know, you have to, like, break down all the ways cards interact with it. But people get excited about playing I cards. mean, in, in other... I'm trying, does any other game have anything that really works like a planeswalker? It's a different mechanic. Not, yeah, I wouldn't say particularly anything else does. Almost everything else that has a planeswalker type card, it's m- going to be closer and more akin to a commander. Yeah, or like, like a, a character, character card you card have that has some other effect that works the game. The same way all the other character cards work. Yeah, that's that's probably going to be the closest thing. A planeswalker is pretty unique to Magic, yeah, as far yeah, as top of my head, I can't think of any other card in a game that works that way. Yeah, I feel like there's been some past card games where there's been like locations that have like an ability and you can attack yeah. them and stuff like that, but still a bit yeah, different. Yeah, Lorcan just added locations. Yeah. And Legend of the Five Rings basically had, like, the sites you attack that had some upside or whatever, and that was a thing. But, yeah, every game adds something or has something a little bit different. But I also thought about this in just the long term, right? If everything stays the same, within a certain space, you do get a little bit bored, right? You're kind of like, well, what's the new thing? Why do I need to buy the new packs or you know, and I, and I get it. Like, I'm one who complains about, I think we have too many keywords in Magic. I like it when we recycle some of those keywords and bring them back up. We don't have to make, like, two new ones or three new ones for every set. I think that's a bit much. Well, and I, I, think, and I bet they wouldn't, but some of them just come out and die on the vine and, like, party. You know, nobody ever wants to see party again. <laughs> it's just... Sure. But it's also because we set it up to only work with a handful of cards. And then we're, we don't have a spot to put it in the future, right? Like, Party could have been in D&D. You know what I mean? Like, but we didn't get it in that set, which was kind of weird, because you literally make a party of things. (laughs) Like, like, why was that not one of the core mechanics of that set? That was, like, the one opportunity we're going to have to bring it back. Well, it started in what, I guess, whatever the first D&D set was, and then it just... Uh, No, it was in one of the Zendikar sets, I think. Oh, okay. I think is what it was. Because we had, like, allies and stuff the first time, and I think we got party or whatever the next time. But I I think we we have to... Now, again, you can have power creep too fast, which I think is a real argument in some games. Like, themes get too big too fast. I, I think that's real. But we've seen more often than not that games adding stuff that's like, okay, let's boost this power a little bit. Let's give this card another ability. Let's take a cost off of a thing. Let's do this, like... That gets people more excited. Those cards end up being the $10, $15 cards that people want to go buy, as opposed to it just languishing as a middling card in the set being $2 to $5, right? And people go, oh, well, there's no reason for me to buy these, or I don't. Hell, what I have noticed, surprisingly, is it's affected people even wanting to booster draft, which is interesting because they're not often the ones trying to play with these rare cards or whatever, but they want to be able to resell cards that they've drafted with so they can play more drafts right or at least get discounts on other drafts but when you're opening a bunch of rares that are two and three dollars well you have to hope that all of your rares are on the upper end to even get a free draft at some point right at least when there's a couple of big cards you might open a money card and every other every third draft is free and that's cool and the others are just discounted but you can't even do that if you're opening a bunch of one and two three dollar rares right (laughs) So that, that's a tough thing that you're encountering. So that makes people less reluctant to want to go to the local store and draft. They're like, well, what's exciting? What cards am I even trying to open? You know, But at the same time, those same players will tell you, well, I don't want rares or mythics that are overpowering the draft or whatever, right? If you open those, right? So it's like this catch-22. Like we said before, right? Players want cards that are cheap, but they really want them to be cheap when they want to acquire them but they want them to have value when it's time to trade or sell them. And it's hard to have a world where both those things exist. So you're going to have to have more flashy, bigger cards or whatever over time. So you can keep that going and keep it collectible and keep people interested and keep people buying more cards. 
But I don't know. That aside, I think Thunder Junction is kind of cool. <laughs> like I've looked at the cards they previewed the first couple days, and I'm kind of into it, dude. I don't know how you feel about it, but I actually like the art, the aesthetic. People have some gripes from like the story point of how everybody ended up in Thunder Junction, but I don't know if the cards are cool. I'm in. Like, yeah, I, and I don't honestly know how I feel yet because I'm worried about the. Well, I mean, it's, if if the cards are good, I, I guess the thing will sell. I don't know because you know we. Just, we just went here with Hearthstone, so it feels like, okay, this is going to be the second Wild West-themed thing I've played in, what was that, six or eight months ago that set came out, so it's a little little weird. Yeah, that is an interesting thing, too, right? Like, will it be affected by people being exposed to this genre fairly recently? Right? Because in a way... For Wizards, it's like, okay, we're just going to take a shot in the dark. We're going to do this western theme thing, see how it goes. But at the same time, how many players have been exposed to some other western theme thing in some other games that they've been playing? Right? Whether Also, it's... who even, you know, because, I, yeah, we're, you know, <laughs> we're on the uh, older end of the gaming spectrum. So, yes, yeah, so we, we have favorite western movies. I don't know that I, any of my children has ever sat through a western of it, except maybe rango you know or something like that but really that's interesting so your, your kids well, have never sat through a western they're teenagers what's the last western that was even in theaters that's what i was about to say that's going to be the bigger issue so, like, yeah, the what genre is, the most is not <laughs> it's not hot right now was it like the did they do that version of the magnificent seven or whatever it was was that the most recent one it might be and that's and probably even that's like four years. years ago five years ago I think longer than that because they've had a sequel to it. So okay, yeah. So that's, be that's the one I can think of. Yeah, I mean, there's man. probably been something else. Oh yeah, I'm sure there have been other like, ones, but they didn't. I mean, there's also been some that are like set in that time period, but I wouldn't really call them westerns. They're more just like dramas that happen to be kind of set in that space. Yeah, Tombstone. But, yeah, I guess you could argue has a western aesthetic, even though it's set in modern times. But it'd be largely. The, the story is a story you could easily tell in eighteen. Yeah, Tombstone I would right? classify as a Western. Or, or not but, Tombstone. Uh, but Tombstone's old. You know, Yellowstone's what I meant to say. Oh, Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's fair. I mean. Yeah, it, it is, you know, basically people fighting over land and honor and stabbing each other. So, yeah, it's basically a Western, but it's said in modern times. Yeah, that's true. At least as far as TV shows go. That makes sense. Yeah, because Tombstone's like what I would put it like if somebody's not watch Westerns or they're not sure if they're going to like them, I would show them Tombstone first <laughs> and be like, because if you don't like Tombstone, you're probably not going to like Westerns as a whole. Yeah, like that does enough to check all the boxes as far as all the tropes. But then it has some like good one liners. You get a little bit of a shootout. You got a couple yeah. different things in it. Like, all right, cool. So you're not just bored of it being an old style Western. But if you do like old style Westerns, there's enough to keep you interested. Because I love them, but I don't know how many current Magic players fall into that category. Yeah, and see, and I think that's the reason even more so that this set needed to have some, we'll call them stronger cards, to keep that interest, right? Because if you're not into that genre, you need a reason to be into it, right? And I get what they tried to do with Karlov Manor, but, it, you know, let's put it in Ravnica because we know people like Ravnica and they don't like the murder mystery thing. I think the miss there, though, was it didn't really matter that you were in Ravnica. Yeah, because you're in one house. <laughs> you, yeah. It's like he, you take a vacation to New York, but you never left your cousin's house. <laughs> you, know, but you didn't really go to New York. People like Ravnica, though, because of yeah. all the guilds and everything Guild else. And, and those weren't even relevant to the story. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I've argued before, should have put in a new Capenna, we probably got away with a lot more and been fine. You know, but it is what it is. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how people take to the set. But in two days, we've seen a lot of really good cards. So this set should have a lot of fun stuff to play with and a lot of fun stuff to play commander with, I think is going to be another big thing. Oh man, I just realized, I don't know if you can hear it. I'm starting to have a good rainstorm. That doesn't happen that often here. Oh, I'm wow. excited. <laughs> it must be hitting here because my lights just flickered. So you cut that out. Yeah, this is cool. Cause like normally that's the secret about living in the Pacific Northwest. Like it, drizzles a lot or there's a little bit of like light rain but there aren't really like rain storms so you get like a couple of those a year and it's just like oh real rain awesome but anyway let's move into the soapbox and talk about some things 
and this one, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. This one's one that I have suspected something for a very long time. And it's that some sellers are racist or at least have racist tendencies. And I'll explain here in a second. But I want to be clear, like, there's sometimes I buy stuff in Facebook groups. There's stuff I buy long distance. It gets mailed and we do some exchanges that way. There's local stuff I pick up. There's stuff I pick up when I'm traveling to shows, right? I know I'm going to be in town. I look around the local area. I'll just mail stuff back to myself. I make deals all kinds of different ways when I'm buying cards and stuff and collectibles. But occasionally you get somebody who, and, I, and I'll find stuff that's posted for a week. Some stuff's been up a couple hours. Some stuff's been up a couple months. And sometimes I'll just reach out because I'm like, hey, I noticed this listing's still up. Are you still trying to sell it? Is it available? You know, maybe I'll offer a lower price because they've been sitting on it for a while, whatever the case might be. But sometimes they respond back quickly with like, no, sorry, it's not available. Or, you know, sorry, already sold it, whatever. And I don't really think about much, you know, just like whatever. That happens. But then you realize it's still up like a week later. It's like, okay. And I'm even willing to forgive that. Like, because I would think if somebody reminded you about it and you're getting emails about it, you probably go delete it or whatever, take that post down or whatever, because you already sold the thing, right? Especially since a lot of times when you reply to it, it's linked right to it. They can just hit the delete button and get rid of it or market is sold or whatever the case might be, depending on what you're using. But one or once or twice, I have seen it come down. You're like, okay, cool. They just forgot to take down the listing. No big deal. But the other times where it's still up later on, I did follow up before. And one was like, oh, no, sorry, I just didn't take it down or whatever. And then they go take it down. But I'm not sure if they really didn't take it down or just like I just remind them about it and they're tired of being annoyed by me or whatever. But then this most recent couple of times it happens, I started really questioning some stuff. So I decided to do an experiment. Reached out to a friend, said, hey, dude, here's a link to a couple of things where I'd reached out to some people for some collections. Like, would you mind responding to one of these and just. Don't use the exact same language I did, but just tell them you're interested, want to make a purchase, see how much they want for the collection, whatever. Not only did he get a response, he got a quick response, and they immediately wanted to know, start talking business, threw an offer out to him, whatever. I'm like, okay. So I respond to you. You tell me it's already been sold or it's not available. I check a couple days later, it's still listed. I get one of my... Friends, and we will say he has no melanin in his skin. <laughs> he asks and reaches out and immediately gets a response to do business. I don't know how else to classify that. Like, you, I mean, because I think you are so racist, you don't even want to take my money. Right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I, like, even in Django, once Big Daddy found out, you know, they were buying slaves for $5,000, like, oh, no, wait. <laughs> Come yeah. on in. That's the lemonade. So you are literally more racist than Big Daddy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's and it's one of those things where, like I said, I sort of suspected something didn't feel right a couple of times. And I was like, you know what? Just let it slide. Stuff happens. People forget to delete stuff, whatever. But then when you that know, happens, our, 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 our friends that are not of color don't realize how many times we give the benefit of the doubt. We don't, we don't want to believe you're racist. Yeah, you know we, we that, that's not where we don't we don't enjoy getting discriminated against. Despite what you <laughs> hear, people thinking like, oh, you know, you're from the left, you're woke, you enjoy being a victim. No, I like it when people just do legitimate business. I love it when people treat me the same as they treat anybody else. But listen, we always try to give you. The benefit of the doubt, and then so many times, because like you said, what else is that? You yeah, had that's that's my problem, right? Because now I'm just like, how else do you explain that? that? Can't be yeah. anything else. You know what I mean? Literally, the only other thing is next time it happens, I'll probably have one of my black friends reach out to see if they get the same response, right? Yeah. So then, because then if it happens to both of us, and then it doesn't happen to the white, then I'll know for sure. Right. <laughs> but but uh, like I said, it, it's a rough feeling, man. It's a rough feeling. Like I've I now don't get me wrong. I've had a couple of times I've also showed up to buy some stuff, and it felt a little awkward. Like you could tell there's a little bit of tension, and like maybe somebody didn't know, <laughs> right? But at that point, you're already there with money in hand. Nobody says anything. You just do the I transaction. You'd go. Be taller. 
Yeah. So like at that point, you just do the transaction and go on about your business. But yeah, I started thinking like, because as this I mentioned another... before, I, I've been accused of you know sounding white and then invited out to somebody's house or to an event. Like, oh, you're Brian Allen, mm-hmm. Brian Allen from the Shreveport. Te- yeah, the one. I, yes. <laughs> yep. Same. Same one. One I'm, and only. I'm black. <laughs> I write about that from time to time, you know. So yeah, you, exactly. You could, even a little bit of research, you'd have known that. Yeah, man, it's it's a crazy thing. I don't, because like you said, like you don't, we don't walk around thinking everybody's racist. You go, okay, yeah, somebody just made a mistake, whatever. Yeah, but somebody could be when, having a bad day, you know, like you said. Or somebody, yeah, of course. Especially at the beginning, you said somebody maybe just forgot to take a listing down. You're in your head. Trying to give them every other logical excuse. It's just tough, man. It's just tough. And that's what I said. Like I now I'm in a spot of just going, how many opportunities have I missed to make money because of this? Right. Now I will say those situations came up way more when I was in Texas. <laughs> like I can even say there was a dude I found uh, two people actually. It could be more, but I only know of two that literally went 30 minutes further away to sell cards to a different store that didn't even pay as well as I did because they didn't want to do business. They would come see me whenever we had something on sale or had a crazy deal, but otherwise they wouldn't want to do business with us. But when it came time to sell stuff, whatever, Oh, well, they'll just go to this other place. And it was like, and some people even told them that's how I found out about it. I was like, dude, I told them you just take them up to the game closet. Like you'll get more than these guys are going to give you like, Oh, I'd rather do business here. Or whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. Whatever. <laughs> We are like, no way involved. <laughs> yeah, is what it is, man. And again, could be for another reason. But I'm just saying. Seems kind of yeah, bad. They, they probably would be okay if you were just working the counter. But, you know, as the owner, they, they didn't want to. Yeah. I mean, I, I've told those stories that. before. I got a pile of them. You know, I mean, when, when you became the owner, you became classified as uppity. Yep. Well, dude, and here's the thing. The, we're also talking about deals where, like, I'm willing to drive two hours, three hours to go complete the deals. We're going to just make an after a day out of it, right? Go in the morning, go buy the stuff, maybe hang out, do some shopping, eat or whatever, drive home, right? Like, I'm going to them, doing the extra work, spending the gas, I'm paying for shipping for stuff to be shipped to me or whatever. Still not interested. And I'm like, all right, this is just weird, man. And then now that that's happened, that, that just opens up another category of things that I was like, you didn't really want to think about it, but now it's there. So now I got to explore this further. So next time it comes up, other situation, we'll talk about it, but we'll see. Anyway, you got something else to talk about. Yeah, we had a good old fashioned newsroom revolt over at the uh, NBC networks because they attempted, I guess not attempted, Technically had hired former uh, RNC chairwoman Rhonda McDaniel I to heard come in and, yeah, and be, you know, their, obviously their Republican expert. And, and yeah, I'm OK with people. I, I, you know, I want you to hear from both sides. That's what we need. You know, we, we need to try to get back to where we're not just hopefully attempting to bite each other's heads off, although it's hard because. I don't know the, the last time they the two sides have been quite this far apart. We can't even agree on just even who won the election. And so when when this hire was announced, almost instantaneously, reporters came on to ask other reporters, "How can you? How could we? How?" And after about I guess about twenty four to forty eight hours of basically almost every NBC or MSNBC host saying that she was not welcome on their show, NBC realized they'd be paying this woman, I'm sure, an exorbitant, possibly six-figure salary to not be able to appear on anybody's show. (laughs) The ownership and the the writers have two different points of view because they often come from two different economic classes. The example I always tell you about is when I was writing at the Times, working in the editorial department, I had to write an editorial being opposed to minimum wage increase while getting paid minimum wage. Yeah, that's not smart. (laughs) Because, you know, that's, you know, people just assumed that I was going to, no, no, at that level of my career, I was basically being told what my opinions on things were. (laughs) You know, 
that that chairperson's situation is kind of how I view these people that will talk against a brand. Or like we can use magic as an example. If people want to like complain about everything Wizards does, whether it's good or bad, it's never good enough, blah, blah, whatever. And then be like, I don't know why they didn't pick me to be a guest at the show. I don't know why they didn't put me in the ambassador program. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of that same thing. It's like, oh, now there's an opportunity. You go apply for it. And then you're surprised there's backlash or whatever. Right. And we said it before, we we are right here on the show. We like we were just talking about, right? We've complained about some sets because we think they messed up with them. Yeah. Right. But we also talk about the things we like about the other sets that are doing well or whatever. Right. You got to have some balance to it. If all you're doing is attacking somebody all the time, they're not going to want to work with you. Like, and then in this case, for whatever reason, they still were going to give you an opportunity to work with you. And then everybody that works with them was like, nah, son. <laughs> like, yeah. Sorry, you've made our life terrible for the last four or five years. Like, I mean, I'm a believer of it's all right to have some outside opinions. It's okay to have some people who even aren't 100% on board. That's good. Let's get into what did we learn this week? Because, man, there's some things this week. So, yeah, I don't know. Yours is probably going to be a little more surprising for people, but maybe an interesting perspective. Yeah, uh, as we've mentioned on the show, Overwatch 2 is going through some rough times, and today it just almost felt like uh, th- th- this could be the beginning of the end. Because if you if you ask any, there's a bunch of hero shooters out there right now. Overwatch, um, X Defiant is kind of being teased. I don't know what's ever coming out, but yeah, there, yeah, there, there are probably, I don't know, 15 hero shooters that are active right now, but none of them until today featured the actual superheroes that we grew up watching and loving. If you haven't seen the trailer yet, Marvel Rivals is essentially Overwatch, only they made it (laughs) Spider-Man. So I can just imagine, Activision Blizzard probably knew this was in the works because I'm sure they have, you know, huge contacts. But yeah, this is, first I got the, everybody thought of when they saw this, man, Overwatch just really, (laughs) this is, much as I love Soldier 76 and all the characters, because I talk about Overwatch on this show all the time, I love them, but man, I, I'd rather be Spider-Man <laughs> if, you, if you give me the choice between those two. You know, though, I don't even know if it's just Overwatch. Because, you know, I've said it before. I've been kind of disillusioned with first-person shooters because, and now again, I'm not super nuanced in every game, but when I play them, they feel very similar, just with, like, a different skin. Like, do I like a certain story? Do I like a certain feel? But from what you've told me and what we've seen so far in these trailers for this Marvel game, like, it even plays different. Yeah, I mean, it's, when Overwatch first came out, you know, it was this was revolutionary because, okay, this isn't just we're going to run around and shoot each other. People had essentially superpowers. It almost felt like, you know, Call of Duty and League of Legends had a baby to some extent. And this is kind of what Marvel Rivals looked like only even... To, to the 10th power, I mentioned to you that I, I saw more innovation in this two to three minute trailer that I've seen in the past probably two to three seasons of Overwatch. There's abilities where people like, you know, Iron Man and Captain America do team up moves because, of course, it's a Marvel comic. Everybody got to do, do a team up move at some point. Of course, Groot and Rocket Raccoon have a team up move where they work together. And it just, everything's, like, yeah, this is just everything we have wanted from a hero shooter. But with actual superheroes that everybody knows, most people love, and just it's but dude, absolutely imagine possible. It's possible they can like, drop the ball. Capture but... the flag, right? And you're like, oh, he's making a run for the flag, and like Hulk just grabs Wolverine, and it's like right, throws him down an alley to get the guy before he gets the flag or whatever. Yeah, that's right? What we're talking about like that's way more interesting than a absolutely. lot of these other games. And who knows? Like, begin because it's superheroes, the door's wide open to do all kinds of things. And a closed alpha coming in May. One of the things that may hold it back, at least initially, is right now it's only for PC, but I'm sure if it gets the reception that it wants to, it'll eventually hit. How how do you make a Marvel superhero shooter game and not put that on the Nintendo Switch? I don't think you can. (laughs) There's going to be too big an audience to, to not do that at some point. That's true. I, that's one I would at least consider looking at and trying out. Yeah. Like, whereas a lot of the others, I kind of just went like, eh, those are probably going to be cool, but I'm not going to make special time to play them. And part of Marvel slash Disney's plan to just wherever you are, whatever TV show you like, whatever kind of movie you like, 
whatever kind of video game you like, they, they got something for you because they have a property that fits into each one of those categories. And we're seeing where the card game, uh, Slay the Spire type game, they're hitting all the genres and really, for the most part, are doing an incredible job doing it. Midnight Suns, again, I've been preaching, <laughs> preaching it for well over a year now. It didn't sell well, but it's an incredible game. If you even kind of sort of like superhero Slay the Spire type stuff or RPGs, please go pick that up. It's probably on, actually on PlayStation Plus, I believe it's free now for you to download. All right. I got an interesting one here. And this study apparently happened a couple of years ago, but started resurfacing probably because of social media. Some people probably shared some stuff on TikTok or whatever. But there was a study done by a couple of scientists in New South Wales in Australia and a group of scientists at the University of Miami, Ohio, I believe. Now, the interesting thing to their conclusion was that men that tend to be worse at games or at the game they're playing are more likely to exhibit habits of toxicity as well as harass women in games more often. And I was like, Least shocking study ever. Yep. I'm like, that tracks, right? It, it, and what I like about it is two things. One, it kind of does just line up with what we've experienced, right? Because the good players are just like, whatever. Can you follow instructions and do what the team wants to do? Whatever. Yeah. We went in. Cool. I don't give a damn. Right. <laughs> like, that's kind of it. Is everybody doing their thing? And the good player knows that the quickest way for a team to lose, even if the players on that team are better, is for a toxicity break. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because how it's easy to be like, well, I'm not going to heal that dude. He just, you know, called me a he called me a racial slur or, or told me to go make him a sandwich or something. I ain't healing him. Why would I? Exactly. One of the other things too that they pointed out was that the they believe or their conclusions were that some of this comes from a lack of emotional development, thinking that losing to a woman is somehow socially debilitating. When in reality, you turn the game off, you walk away. It ain't like anybody's going to know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, unless you're just yeah. playing with friends or something. Like, it, like if you're just playing in line, it's a bunch of strangers. Who cares? Right? It's well, really irrelevant to the next point in your life. tie way too much of their, <laughs> of their personality to how good they are at a game. It becomes their entire identity. That's fair. That's a thing we know is way too common in too many games. You know, but I thought it was interesting because now... If somebody wanted to, I mean, they're kind of could just point out a link to the article that the person's just telling on themselves now, right? Like you start giving a woman crap just because she's in the game or like she killed you or whatever. She can just link you to the article and be like, well, you must not have been that good anyway, <laughs> right? Or whatever. Right. Like the study says there's a per real percentage chance that you are just not as good as you think you are carrying all that negativity around to other players. They're so, yeah, also going to be the person that's most likely to make a racial slur, mm -hmm. most likely to blame anybody else on the team for being the reason they lost. When, oh, of course. When, when you can pull up their stats and they missed as many or more shots than anybody or weren't on there, just whatever, whatever it needs to be. Because in almost any game, people giving tips will tell you, especially a team-based game, having a plan, especially the lower ranks, having any kind of a plan and executing it is better than running around like the proverbial chicken. Oh yeah. Just being organized on any level. Yeah. <laughs> just star Lord, even 25% of a plan is yep. often enough <laughs> to win the game. Yeah. If your enemy's got no plan, Hey, yeah. why not? So yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I, I don't know why it just started coming up recently, but it's one that I went, yeah, that, checks out with everything i know it's one of those we probably need to come back to periodically because every day we're see, we see some ridiculous story or some exaggerated case of guys being terrible to women what's even funnier is you can almost just point to people and be like hey if you want to not be looked at as a worse player try being nicer to people <laughs> right like and that just becomes a good habit anyway like just in life even even gamers, you know, that later are proven to be trash human beings, but being racist, sexist, what have you, we, in between the lines, as they would say, when they're when they're actually doing what they do to earn money, 
treat everybody equally. They may get offline <laughs> and call them everything but a child of God, but when the game is on the line, they are usually less toxic. That's yep. not a hundred percent. There's you know for for every for every example, there's you know there's a PewDiePie out there. Also fair. All right, let's get into some topics. We're gonna have to hit these pretty quick because we got a lot to cover. This first one, I don't know, man. I feel like this is becoming at least like an every eight or nine month thing. But they have another artist that basically stole somebody else's artwork. Uh, in this case, the artist was Faye Dalton. Uh, he did the artwork for Trouble in Pairs, which is a newer card from one of the last couple of sets. And it's already dumb to copy somebody's artwork. Not a smart move. Even worse, we're going to be working with one of the big companies. Because, one, that's a lot of future earnings that you may be screwing up. But even worse, in this case, stole artwork from another magic artist that is known for doing magic and has a huge following in the magic community. So it's like, you took artwork from Donata Giancola, tried to do enough on it to say I didn't completely copy your homework, put it into your piece, and thought it was just going to go unnoticed. Yeah, not cool. And and here's the weird part to me. They did just enough to try to, like, I'll adjust the arm position or whatever, holding the weapon, and, you know. But still, like, in the original artwork, it was done for a cyberpunk-style piece. So there's almost like a uh, a glow or electric kind of thing to the doorway next to the person. But in the new piece, you still kept a doorway behind it and just kind of changed the type of frame it is. And then in the old piece, there's a stairway behind it. And the new piece kept the stairway behind it. I'm like, you you could have just got rid of these other things and just kept the character and still pulled off what you need. But you just, I don't know, like... You just, you did enough to try to change it and you didn't do anything at all at the same time. I don't know how anybody in this age of the internet where you can just instantly Google somebody else's image or anything else you want to know that anybody thinks they'll get away with stealing art. Yeah, 15, 20 years ago, sure. Even in the early days of the internet, we'd have had to probably get on a, a IRC forum and, yeah. and, and compare notes and it would have taken, you'd have already been to the bank gotten your check and gotten away with it. But nowadays it is far too easy to do just the tiniest bit of research in seconds. Yeah. I just don't get it. And again, it's work for really at this point, probably the biggest buyer of artwork in the gaming and fantasy industry. Right. So that's kind of silly. Because, again, you're costing yourself future jobs, future artwork, whatever, opportunities. But you also are going to be putting it in front of one of the largest audiences. So if somebody's going to see it, you're putting increased number of eyeballs on this work you stole. 233 episodes. How many times have we done this story already? Oh, there's been several where this has come up. You see, like, this is at least the 10th or 12th time we've had. I don't know hey, if it's quite somebody... that many, but it's a lot. <laughs> it seems it's like lot. way more than you think for how, or I, I guess, I think, I think I'm probably thinking about other problematic artists. That well, we've had a lot of with. artist problems, yes. Yeah. That is so definitely a thing. Like, you know, you're... <laughs> Your uh, Noah Bradley yep. and uh, Therese Nielsen. That probably takes us to 10 or 12, just in general, stories about problematic artists. Yeah. And again, it's just like you took artwork from somebody who's well, not just well known in the art community, well known, particularly in the magic community, to use their artwork for a magic card. Like, like you, you chose one of the worst possible situations and people to even copy something from. That's what's even crazier. So, yeah. Now, I haven't done the follow-up to see what Wizard's response is, but if it's like the others, they're probably <laughs> going to say, hey, one, we're Fired. investigating it, and two, probably cutting off work with this person till future yeah. notice. And it's just like, man, how is... And that future notice ain't ever going to come. <laughs> yeah. There, there are too many like... artists to work with that don't steal people's art for you to ever get a shot again. It's just so tough because I'm just like, 
how did you think this was going to go? There, there, you know, as we talk about on here, we, every every week we he- see or hear somebody doing something terrible, but you know, two weeks later, they, their career has recovered. If their career ever took, there are but a handful of things you can't sure, do sure. <laughs> and and never work again. And for an artist or any kind of creative, plagiarism is one of them. That's that, true. That's the thing <laughs> that just. Or you get a you, live bunch of smaller jobs. You won't get the big high profile jobs anymore. Yeah. You know, that's the tough part. But like I said, I'm just like, you could have, I mean, you have technology. You could have changed the proportions of the body, you know, maybe given the character bigger arms or a larger head or, you know, whatever. But I saw a laid over image and it's, it's pretty damn close, except for where they changed the elbow position or whatever. Like it's it's the same thing. They change the hairstyle and stuff, but like, dude, why? You know, and I get it. You might have been pressed for time or whatever, but it ain't worth doing that and costing your like. You talk about fumbling the bag. You know what I mean? Like, if you do good work and people, especially if people are fanning your card and everything else, and you're getting invited to shows, like, opportunities are endless. You get to go to yeah. all these other different tournaments, conventions, whatever. Sell all this prints and play mats and. Yeah, just sad to see it go down that way. But all right, there's also another story, and this one's a couple weeks old, but we kind of had to pass it on to this week. But Post Malone and Lil Wayne, trouble with the IRS. And we only bring it up because Post Malone's obviously been on a lot of different magic yeah. content, you know, obviously bought the one ring. He's been on a bunch of people's commander stuff. But yeah, supposedly, according to the story, their companies got some of the, I guess, support money during COVID or whatever. And part of the thing was they were supposed to have supposedly drug-free work environments. And now there's claims that they don't have that or didn't have that at the time. So they're supposed to pay back these loans or notes or whatever. And I guess they didn't. L- Lil Wayne didn't have... No, yeah. no, you got dispersed. I, I, I'm just shocked <laughs> that Lil Wayne didn't have a drug-free work environment. I just... I mean, Lil Wayne, hell, he was on the syrup for a while. Right. So, and he, like, I, I'm not saying it's right, but I almost feel like if you, as any entity that, that loans or grants money, gave Lil Wayne <laughs> money with the condition that there not be any drugs involved, it's like, come on, man. I just feel like this is almost on you, it, it feels true. like. True. Now, from what I could read through, which is probably why this is going to be a little bit of a drawn-out case, I couldn't find anything that said there was a reason there was proof of the thing other than the people. Oh, as you said, Lil Wayne has an obvious, yeah, yeah, yeah. documented. But I'm saying, but even in the case of like Post Malone, there wasn't like, oh, well, we found out these people were doing drugs at work or there was no drug testing policy or whatever. At least not yet. Yeah, we haven't seen it, but I'm sure if the federal government is going in, there's documentation. So it'll be interesting. It was mostly reported based on them as owners, I guess of these companies, but we'll see. The federal government doesn't get defeated too often in court. So oh, you sure. know now, I will say, what's the outcome most likely? Probably just going to pay some fines or whatever money they're yeah. due and whatever. Everybody's probably going to go on about their business. It's going to be how much do you have to pay? And also we brought it up because, you know, the whole, uh, I guess, uh, I forget how many, let's say maybe about a year ago, we talked about uh, why Post Malone was out front and center and doing promotional stuff for Magic. And then said, hey, whatever happened to, you know, Project Greenlight, where we were supposed to be giving money to up and coming creators. And it sounds like apparently what just happened is Project Greenlight got given to Mr. Beast <laughs> and Post Malone. And we even argued on here that let's be perfectly honest. Post Malone is going to put, or Mr. Beast would put more eyes sure. on your product than what Daquan or I would put on your product. Absolutely. But not even close. But it, by the same token, neither I or Daquan would have gotten in trouble for not having a drug free workplace. So it's, uh, oh, yeah, this, when this you is... deal with celebrities, you kind of pay your money and you take your chances. Yeah, that's kind of what, what's always going to be a thing, you know. And we've seen it over the years with all kinds of brands. Like you, you can't control individuals once they're not under contract or doing the thing with you. So whatever happens, happens. Yeah, you know, but like, what, this is what insurance companies do before they give people money. Again, Lil Wayne. You, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You gave Lil Wayne some now, money. 
with to the be condition fair, that it was a drug free. Come on. We, we've heard of a lot of companies that got some COVID money and there's all kinds of things involved. So this does not surprise me. I will at least say that. It, you shouldn't have given it to him, but I'm not shocked that he got it. Well, also true. <laughs> you know, there was a lot going on at that time. But yeah, crazy situation. I don't know how it's going to affect anything. Like I said, I expect this will be one of those cases that's going to drag out for probably like six, seven months. They'll and do the all their research. The thing for Magic is that, you know, if if this goes on, well, I mean, it's, uh, it's possible on a little way. It's going to keep getting attention. And at some point, they're going to write the story that does the big list of all the rich <laughs> a-hole things that these people bought with the money, and they're going to mention the one ring because it's oh, the sure. most obvious. Oh, this guy paid $2 million for a piece of cardboard because if you know nothing about magic, you have no idea why a piece of cardboard could be worth $2 million. Those of us that play obviously know that you could argue it in 10 years could be worth Three or four times that, but the the average person writing that story doesn't know that. They don't have that back. Yeah, I mean, there's also the, like, does it just put eyeballs on you anyway? Right? Like, does anybody care? Other than people discover that magic cards can be $2 million. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't know how people are going to view this. It's often said that there's no such thing as bad publicity, and celebrities test that on an almost daily basis. That's also true. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I don't, I don't. Like I said, I think this is probably... One of those things is just going to get settled at some point. Yeah, I'll just figure out what the number is going to be, and they'll just pay it. I mean, hell, he's still, and since then, has been doing multiple tours and everything else, making piles of money anyway, both of them. So it's not like it even matters. All right, so I'm sure some people have heard about this thing that Elon Musk, and I don't know which arm of his company uh, was supposed to be putting this together, but the thing they were calling Neuralink, which basically... The idea is we will jack a thing into your brain and you can use your brain to control things like operate technology, you know, whatever. Well, we actually have the first person and I believe is the first person who's had the Neuralink brain implant, I guess we'll call it, inserted. And I saw a thing of him using it to play a game of chess, like, you know, click the options, move the piece on the board, pass the turn, you know, whatever. Supposedly, and this is amusing to me, that the first real game he decided to play was Civilization VI and stayed up all night playing it, which is awesome. Yeah, if, if you <laughs> if you probably ask me, <laughs> what you, you you give a nerd a neural link, what's one of the first, Civilization probably be top five guesses. Yeah, and the thing is, I thought about it because this person is a quadriplegic, so minimal if any feeling on extremities from the neck down, and. Playing a game like that, you do have to do a lot of, like, shifting the map, clicking buttons so you can see what everybody else is building, where you want to put stuff, you know, setting up jobs to be worked on. There's a bunch of stuff going on. By the late game, you're doing probably easily 25, 30 actions a turn and responding to other people's actions. And, yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, and then there's in-story stuff, right? Diplomacy things like, do you want to help us do whatever? Do you want to attack this person, right? I think you got to even has climate change. I mean, it's gotten extremely complex. But the cool part about that is he was able to play all that just from looking at the screen. That's that that's both both exciting and scary to me at the same Isn't time. Because I was thinking about like, because and we talked about this off the show, right? For somebody in that situation, it makes total sense to go for it, right? Because you're talking about completely changing this man's quality of life, right? He can do so much more just being able to access things and operate things and whatever that you just couldn't before. And that's huge for me as an able-bodied person. I'm probably not going to do it until we reach a point that like one, you know, all the safety features and protocols are in place, but two that you can show me, okay, does this benefit open up way more doors for me? Like as an example, if I'm worried about my phone listening to me talk or whatever, I also get all these other benefits of having the phone. So it's like, whatever, I'll put up with it. If it's a thing, it's a thing, right? But right now, there's not enough things that I could do with the Neuralink thing, whatever. Now, if you could put a little thing in my finger and maybe I can speed up using things at the bank or, you know, whatever, like I might do some for convenience purposes. If you can do that without having to jack into my brain and my whole like neural system or whatever, 
Like, I might be down for a little bit of Even something. Even to put in your finger, they've had to, at that point, enter your neural system. Well, I mean, if it's a little chip that just, like, you know, like you have in your pets where you scan stuff or whatever, like, that can just be there. I'm okay with that. But until we're, when we start doing the more invasive things, it's the benefit's got to be higher. But it's cool that, I mean. Think about how many times you see somebody go in for just minor surgery and come out dead. Yeah. I feel Chris like Candido, I think, had a broken ankle and ended up dead. It can happen for sure. But what I started thinking about, though, is what if this works and this becomes a thing and we get four or five, six patients where it's all successful? Like, what are the opportunities there? Right. Like, what can you control? What like where do we advance beyond that? Like, you know, we talked off the air about like, do you, do you start getting other robotic parts and robotic eyes and whatever? And like, what does that lead to of the things you could do? We I have mean, lived do we to just... see the bionic man possibly be the six million dollar or six million dollar man and bionic woman possibly become reality. Yeah, do we start living like androids or or worse yet, like Robocop or something? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like there's some crazy stuff, but the technology is here and it works. Like we have an example of somebody using it now, and it's crazy. I remember some apparently uh, Mark Wahlberg has been trying to get the six million dollar man option, and they're wondering, first of all, does anybody still care? But he, with, with stuff like this, it's become far more relevant even than it was. But because I mean, in the 70s, it was total sci fi, we yeah, weren't yeah. even close, but apparently, we're here now, <laughs> you know. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, the, we, the six million dollar man is a reality. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I've already seen people with prosthetic parts that are all electronic. Like they move like joints and everything else and they charge their leg and everything else. Like it's a real thing. So we're not far from it. <laughs> like these things can exist. Which and then is of course they'll cool. also have to change the price point because six million dollars is nothing. You well, know, yeah, ain't nothing anymore. Yeah. Now. That's also true. You'd have to a minimum, I guess, be the six billion dollar man. Probably at that level. Getting into the dinner table. And this one's kind of interesting. And I saw this conversation started online. Of what do we think is either the biggest innovation that has made tournaments, events, conventions better, or is there something we think that should exist that doesn't? I, I you know, I'm willing to go first on this one because yeah, because I was about to say you've seen far more tournaments. Than there, I have, there was so. a thing that fortunately I got to be part of that I think really made events better, and it's wizards companion app and i think one of the issues we always had was like judges always having to chase people around every round and like you have to post these things all over the room and we came up with different technology over the years of people using actual video screens and then like people made special programs so you could scroll the pairings and you know we came up with all these different things to try to work through events for a while but now you can have it on your phone it's in your yeah. pocket Right. Like you can get a buzz when the next round pairings are up. Right. If you want to look at standings, you don't have to like stand around the board and compare notes. Can you draw in or not? Right. You just look at your phone and, and figure it out. That to me really changed events as a whole. It just became a whole level of convenience. Hell, even being able to report your matches just from your phone. Right. Like you report, it shows up on the other opponent's uh, phone and they can confirm and you're done. Right. That's it. You don't have to do hardly anything for it. It's, such a cool thing of just changing all those lanes you had to deal with and the crowds looking at pairings, having to go out, especially in bad weather days or when it's cold, you're just having to go outside and get the people having a smoke or whatever to get them back in for the next round. Like a lot of that has changed and it's like so good. There's still a few things they're working on that they're updating over time, but so far just using that has been so much better. And I hope as we get to bigger events, it still scales well and has no issues. So far, it seems to be fine. You can still use it. But I hope it continues to still scale up so we can use it for everything. Because, man, it adds a whole level of convenience that didn't exist before. But I don't know, man. Do you have anything you've seen that's changed or something that you want to be at events that isn't? I mean, yeah, and, and it, it isn't even an event. Well, I, I remember, like, some of my mentors in journalism and other things saying, you know, just, just refer to crawl kind of before you walk. So, yes, in it, like, the companion app is is a, a beautiful thing. It needed to happen. I'd just like to see, like, we literally just talked about them having a tournament next to the main stage while fashion shows and, and 
live event they're having. So just first of all, let's figure out how to never do that again. <laughs> it's like that is is a thing that I don't want that to get brushed over in as as we seek whatever the next. Because absolutely keep working on new things, but don't forget the basic things. Like when that's getting put together, you just feel like somebody you would hope would have looked at that and been like, wait, where is the tournament? <laughs> And where is the, the, the cosplay? Because, you know, the cosplay thing especially is going to is gonna get loud because, you know, fashion shows are loud. And it's essentially a fashion show. Those oh, are like, it's yeah. loud. Not necessarily cameras are flashing, but people's cell phones are flashing, taking pictures. So, yeah. This is... Yeah. And that's one of those things, like I said, is like, it's to the point that I like, I would love for that to change. I just don't know why it has. I mean, I guess I know why it hasn't because people don't pay for a whole extra room. Yeah. And, and, and extra you know, people and traffic and whatever to, to run. The yeah. Bed. We know why. I guess the but, question now is just because I, 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 I know we've talked about it. I'm really, obviously, it was a huge thing on Magic Social Media for several days. Has Wizards responded to any of those questions? I don't think so. And I, or, I are wouldn't. We, and honestly, kind of... I don't even know what their response would be other than like, we're aware there were problems. You know? And then you explain how, if you're going to fix the problems. I guess if you don't plan to fix the problem, then your best PR move is to say nothing. Yeah, exactly. But, and that's what I'm saying. Well, I, I don't expect any changes. Even though yeah, we would like sad. for there to be changes, yeah. I don't expect there to be any. And That's really unfortunate. Like I said, I've been going to conventions at this point for, I don't know, 25 plus years. Same thing at every event. And it's why I don't play any Well, I mean, I don't events. remember there ever being like... You know, because, again, you know, I, I used to play in Magic tournaments on a somewhat regular basis, and I've never had a fashion show going on next to me. Dude, Core, you the know. number of times I have played events. This is, goes all the way back to even when Legend of the Five Rings was a thing. They had a whole thing where they would shout, like, Bonsai and all these other, like, crazy things, like, during their events. And, like, you just hear it echoing through halls and stuff where you're trying to play stuff in the next section right next to them. And it's just like, all right. Like, but that's part of the game. That's a, I guess, an in-game thing. No, you're... that's just a thing oh. they did. It was like oh, extra. Okay. <laughs> like they oh, just yeah. did it. Like that's the weird part. But it's just like there's always been that thing. It's just you put way too many games in one hall, so they're all making noise and the volume's really high. And it's just like I get why they do it. It's a cost thing. You want to have everything in the same room. It creates excitement, whatever. But I think it's just a bad environment for high. And hey, that's absolutely a horrible environment. Yeah, for high, well, I guess for high value, high prize events, I don't think that's a good environment. No, it's a, it's a terrible environment. I I don't know who could defend that as an environment. I understand why you're again. We know the solution, or not the solution, but the the reason is to keep cost. We get that, but it's still a horrible. Uh, imagine playing for you know your share of seventy five thousand dollars, and you can't even hear what's Hell, going I, on. I played nationals one year in the middle of one of those big rooms at Gen Con, <laughs> like, and it was just constant. You had people walking by, and you know you're trying to go put pairings up, and you know there's noise constantly. It's just like, and that and that's it's probably honestly that might be the last big event, and it's because I qualified and I just played, yeah. but. I don't think I've paid an entry to play a high value event since then. And again, it's because there's has been a huge paradigm shift, not just at Wizards, but a lot of places in terms of casual play versus pro play. The the fashion show is for the casual player yeah. or even the person that just likes to watch cosplay. They may never pick up a magic car, but they enjoy seeing people dressed up as their favorite character. And we are in an era when people who don't ever plan to play the game still have a favorite magic character. Yep. That's a, a thing I'm sure they probably never envisioned, you know, when, when they started this game many, many years ago. Now, to be fair, the Pro Tour got its own separate section. <laughs> like, yeah. it was still accessible, but it was blocked off from the majority of the noise and the traffic. And it's like, so it's that mid-level competitive stuff that kind of gets caught in that. that Wait, is, is 75000 considered mid-level? Outside compared to the Pro Tour, you know, like that's that's just an event at a convention. A pro Tour is part of a whole promotional machine with hundreds of thousands of dollars available and whatever. So they get they get their own space and their own treatment. That's just the way it is. Not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's the way it's been. 
but yeah, I'm with you. It's something that definitely should change. And I'd be nice to see it change. I it's I'm I guess call me jaded, but having seen it for 20 plus years, 25 plus years, I'm just like, I it's not gonna change at this point. Like I, I just can't imagine that it will. I'm with you. I would love for it to, and it'd be awesome if it did. Every time we saw an event that had more than I don't know, ten thousand dollars worth of prizes, maybe gets its private special, I don't want to say special space, but at least a more blocked off secluded space. So it's not in the middle of all the noise would be yeah. awesome. I just don't know who's going to be the first one to, to make that happen if it hasn't happened yet, but I'm with you. I think that's a good one. If anybody's listening, Hey, probably something you should do or just don't do those large level events at the conventions. I think is the other solution if you're not going to make for special space, but we'll see how it ends up. But anyway, Brian, went to everybody where they can find you on social media. All right. I am Brian Sonic on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And you can find me everywhere at Power Dragon, P-O-W-R-D-R-A-G-N. And most of the next week, we'll probably be doing lots of Thunder Junction stuff. And you might even see me in a cowboy hat in the next couple weeks. Just saying. But as always, wherever you are listening or watching, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Please remember to take care of yourselves and your family. Remember to be awesome, and most importantly, be awesome to each other.